what was it, two weekends ago, uh, we held, a, a, for us, a small event uh, here in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Jacobs Building uh, for folks that cannot afford health care in this country. And uh, we were just there for a, a one full day and a couple of hours on Sunday. And we saw 1,022 people. And I say that that is, and it was our 600, 659th of those type of events uh, held here uh, nationwide and uh, with some overseas. We've got a program in Haiti, we've got a program in, uh, in, in Guyana, South America, we've got a, a surgery team right now in India doing heavy surgery, but really the focus of what we do at Remote Area Medical is here in the United States. And so 1,022 people uh, came to that event, they got their teeth fixed, uh, some of them, several hundred of them, got a new pair of eyeglasses that we made for them on the spot. And others had uh, consultations with various physicians. And I'm happy to say that there were a number of volunteers with us from the University of Tennessee. In fact, we've actually had several hundred uh, volunteers from the University of Tennessee uh, in the recent past. Um, uh, about a year ago, um, I had breakfast with the sixth man to walk on the moon, uh, astronaut Ed Mitchell. And uh, astronaut Ed Mitchell asked me, he said, uh, why did you, what was the reason for starting uh, this remote area medical thing, otherwise known as RAM? And I said, well, you have to go way, way back into the last century. And uh, I, was, uh, I was a cowboy. Uh, just a kid, actually, but I was a cowboy where all the cowboys were Indians. And this was on the border of Brazil, and it was an area of um, several thousands of square miles of um, tropical savanna uh, surrounded by rainforest. And there were some 50,000 head of wild longhorn cattle that were running around on this, uh, on this vast area and uh, several thousand horses, most of them wild. And, um, uh, and periodically, uh, cowboys had to round them up, and uh, all the cowboys were Indians, except me. And uh, they gave me a horse to ride, a horse called Kang. And Kang was a uh, Wapishana Indian word meaning the devil. <laughs> because because unfortunately Kang had already killed two other cowboys. <laughs> and um, uh, so I was assigned to be the next on the list and, uh, and so we lassoed Kang in the corral and tied him up to a tree and uh, all us cowboys had to make uh, our own saddles so uh, I strapped on this rudimentary saddle uh, that I had made and we were all barefoot cowboys by the way so uh, nobody wore any shoes. And, um, and I climbed on board Kang and uh, pulled off the blindfold and, uh, and they cut him loose and Kang went bucking across the savanna and had a head-on collision with the side of the corral. And I was very badly injured and uh, uh, the cowboys came running over and they pulled me out from underneath uh, the horse and, um, uh, and one of them said in Wapishana, said, well, the nearest doctor is 26 days on foot from here through the rainforest. And when I told that story to astronaut Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, he said, gosh, he said, I was on the moon and I was only three days from the nearest doctor. <laughs> But, but that event, I have to credit this wild horse Kang um, as being the inspiration for telling me that maybe we need to bring doctors a little bit closer uh, than 26 days on foot uh, through the rainforest. So um, I sort of started a campaign uh, that hopefully we would be able to bring some doctors to that region um, while I was there. But, you know, there were no communications. I used to go to town uh, once every couple of years 
uh, and we used to drive these wild cattle. We'd round them up and we'd get about a thousand of them together. And we would drive them through a trail through the rainforest, which is a little bit narrower than this uh, room. And, um, uh, and we would barter them uh, when we got them to the coastal belt, which was several hundred miles away. And, uh, and then we would pack our supplies on our back and we would walk back through the rainforest. And we left our horses on the edge of the rainforest because there wasn't anything to eat, you see, for horses in the, inside the forest. Uh, they don't eat leaves like cattle do. Um, uh, so it was essentially one month on foot. Anyway, when I was in Georgetown, you see, I would talk to, uh, this was back in the, uh, those dark days of the British Empire uh, where Churchill, won, uh, somebody once said that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And, um, uh, and um, so I was dealing really with the British, you see. And uh, uh, I, I had a gentleman down there his name was Major C.J. Bettencourt Gomes, E.M., retired. And uh, he was the sort of liaison person with Whitehall um, with, um, with the health department, the Ministry of Health. And so every time uh, I would go to uh, uh, this place called Georgetown, I would harass um, Major Bettencourt Gomes about, can't we get some doctors? Can you imagine uh, living in a place like where we're living on the Brazil border and there's no doctor and there are thousands of uh, uh, Indians living there uh, and they've got bad teeth and when they get older they can't see and we've really got to do something about this. Well, uh, years later when I got a radio um, and I learned to fly an airplane and, um, and then I was able to make this journey that was, that was a month in, in, in length on foot in just a few hours in the airplane. Um, in fact, what I did uh, in order to learn to fly um, was that I took a two-week course uh, in Georgetown and uh, we swapped a bunch of cattle for this uh, uh, little airplane that was fabric covered and I remember putting a drum of fuel in the back of the airplane and flying it up the Essequibo River uh, to another place, the R Rupununi River, which joined the Essequibo and then came out on the savannah and got down really low and found my way just as if I was on horseback except going much faster to where uh, I used to live on the Brazil border. Uh, unfortunately when I got there we had prepared a sort of rudimentary airstrip that I thought was adequate um, and when I got there I looked out of the airplane window and I uh, could see the Wapishanas down there with their primitive uh, hand tools and um, I came in for a landing I had about 30 hours experience at this point in my career and uh, it was not one of my best landings and um, uh, I came on the brakes a little too heavily running out of airstrip and the airplane flipped over on its back in a pile of wreckage and I called out from underneath the airplane and uh, everybody came over very very excited because they see they thought this was the normal way of landing <laughs> 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 but um, I then got a radio. We, we fixed the airplane uh, eventually, and, uh, and I got sort of rather good at it. And um, uh, then I got a radio, and then I was able to harass Major Betancourt Gomes on the radio about this doctor business. And uh, finally, uh, again, uh, years passed, um, and this is way back in the last century, you know, uh, I think it's like 1950. I'm, I'm a real old guy, by the way, as you probably noticed. And, um, so, uh, Major Betancourt Gomes said, we're going to be up there um, next Saturday, uh, about 4 o'clock. Make sure the airstrip is okay and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and have the tea ready. And I said, well, you know, as long as you bring the tea, we, we can certainly provide the hot water. And um, so, sure enough, the next Saturday, here comes a little government airplane of Major Betancourt Gomes um, with his swagger stick, you know, very naturally dressed in uniform, and a gentleman from Whitehall, Sir Archibald Fenton Sedgwick, who was the, um, uh, the Minister of Health uh, on, a, on a sort of trip, you know, see what's happening in the colonies, you know, all that stuff. And, um, uh, and he was very, uh, he was a tall gentleman and he was a pipe smoker. In fact, he had two pipes and he was never sure which one to use. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so uh, we had tea and Major Ben Corgome said, now Brock, he said, uh, I want you to take uh, 
uh, a sriracha ball out to one of the nearby Indian villages, uh, and so he can see what's going on, you know, this healthcare business he keeps talking about. And, um, uh, but he said, tomorrow being Sunday, uh, it would be very nice if we could have a little church service first, and isn't there a, uh, isn't there a, a, a Roman Catholic missionary priest in this area? And I said, well, yes, there is. I see him every uh, year or two. Um, uh, his name is Father McKinna, and uh, Father McKinna used to walk between these Indian villages, which were 60, 70 miles apart in his bare feet like the rest of us. And um, so Major Betancourt Combs said, well, send out some runners and see if you can find Father McKinna, and we'll have a church service tomorrow morning here uh, at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, well, okay, we'll send out some runners, but what will we do if we can't find Father McKinna and we can't have a church service? And uh, Major Betancourt Gomes said, uh, well, then we'll have gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, uh, so um, uh, we couldn't find Father McKinna. And so they had uh, gin and tonics, and that, now the question is, how are we going to get Sir Archibald Fenton Sedgwick out to the village, which was about five miles away? And um, uh, Major Betancourt Gomes said, well, get your best horse uh, for this, uh, Brock. I said, well, you know, our horses aren't very reliable, you know? And um, he said, absolute nonsense. Uh, uh, Sir Archibald is an experienced rider, 7th Hussars, Indian Army. and." Uh, um, uh, so just get your best horse. Uh, so we brought up this horse. Um, uh, his, his, his name was Rosie. Um, uh, Rosie was a male horse, uh, uh, but we'd done something to Rosie earlier on in his... Uh, 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 anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had Rosie all saddled up there, and, um, uh, and Sir Archibald decided which uh, pipe he was going to smoke. And, um, and then he comes alongside Rosie, and I'm holding on to the front end of Rosie, and um, he addresses Rosie in cavalry fashion and starts to apply weight uh, on the stirrup, the little tiny stirrups that we had, because we were all barefoot cowboys, you know? and, um, and then he starts swinging his leg over the back, and he gets it halfway over, and Rosie uh, didn't like this, and so Rosie started to back up, and Sir Archibald was sort of halfway over on Rosie's bottom, and then Rosie reared up and fell over backwards on top of Sir Archibald. And Major Bencourt Gomes shouts, I Brock, what have you done? And I call out to the Indian cowboys, I said, Kadiman Sutana Parangare Kawara Warren Ik, which is Wapishana, it means get the white man out from underneath the horse. <laughs> so so we extracted um, uh, Sir Archibald, and Sir Archibald got up. The first thing he was concerned about was his pipe. We found his pipes for him, and he dusted himself off. He said, Brock, he said, I would like to try that again, uh, but do you have another horse without reverse gear? <laughs> well, uh, needless to say, we weren't able to do anything about uh, the health care crisis uh, uh, for the Wapishanas. Although I'm happy to say that today we do. But back then, many, many years ago, we weren't able to do anything about it. And uh, I came to this country. And um, uh, I was so out of touch. Imagine living all those years with Wapishana Indians in the Amazon. I was so out of touch with what was going on in this country. And I was in Chicago when I arrived that I donated 50 cents to the Black Panthers <laughs> because. I thought it was to preserve an endangered species. <laughs> and, but the, 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 the thought that I want to, uh, I'm sort of leading up to this, and I think I've only got a minute and a half left. The, the thought that I want to leave with you good folks is that uh, the, there is a terrible crisis here in this country. We've done over half a million patients uh, free of charge. We've had over 70,000 volunteers. I've appeared twice before Congress in Washington, and I was up there just last week again. And uh, it's extraordinary that here, in, in, with this incredible need, that a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, uh, a veterinarian are not allowed to cross state lines in the United States to provide free care. 
And a lot of people don't realize that. And the care that we're providing is free. It's, we don't get money from the government, don't want any. It's no cost to the taxpayer, no cost to the government. But a doctor educated here, perhaps at the University of Tennessee, cannot go to California, where we're going in a couple of weeks' time, incidentally, to provide free care there. And everywhere we go in this country, where we've seen over half a million patients, you cannot find enough volunteers at that location that have a license in that state in order to see the huge numbers of people that come. We're in Los Angeles, we saw 7,000 people. I turned away another 7,000, I'm sure. And three weeks, four weeks from now, we'll be in Northern California, and I bet we'll see, like we did again last year, another 7,000 people. They must change the law in this country to allow willing volunteers who pay their own airline fares to get to these places, they tell me, hey Stan, it's easier for me to volunteer my skills in Guatemala than it is in my own country. And this is something that really has to stop and let these good people who want to help cross state lines to provide free care. Thank you very much indeed.